Yeah, uh, my name is Seth Davenport, and I'm here to talk about UI testing at Well Simple with a microphone, which is fancy. Um, there we go. That's better. That's better. I'm not that tall. <laughs> Okay, uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I have been doing front-end development for about 19 years. Uh, I started my career doing um, plugins for Microsoft Outlook and C, uh, which was a fun time. Um, I've been principal developer at Wellsimple since 2017. Uh, I used to work for Wrangle IO, um, Amazon Oracle, it doesn't really matter. Um, and my current focus right now is I work on a team that does developer productivity tooling um, for our front-end developers at Wellsimple. Um, our business, if you don't know, um, we're a late-stage fintech startup. Um, we bring better financial services to Canadians. Um, you can check out our website if you um, want to find out more. Um, and our front-end practice consists of a mobile app, um, a single-page web app, um, and some internal web portals for various operational tasks. Um, right, so our stack is React DOM and React Native with TypeScript. Um, we have a standardized stack across all of our teams. Um, it's maintained by our front-end platform team. Uh, and it's in one big giant model repo um, that consists of about 1.5 million lines of code, um, over 20,000 unit tests, uh, over 5,000 stories. Um, we've been using Storybook since before Chromatic, actually, so since early v5 days. Um, and this is kind of a snapshot of a typical week for us. Um, uh, we do, you know, we have between 100 and 150 people committing to Maine um, every week. Um, typically 30 to 50 commits a day. Okay, I am a little bit taller than I thought I was. <laughs> All right. Try not to slouch too much. You know what, can I just take it out? Yeah. Without making that sound? Okay. Cool. That's right, better. Um, yeah, so, you know, to manage all of this um, velocity and all of this code, we, our toolchain team has some, like, principles that we like to follow. Oh, fantastic. I'm in. Uh, I don't want to join with audio. I think I just want to join without making feedback, I guess. Um, click, click, click. All right. Um, so our principles are low cognitive overhead. Um, you know, we want to enable cross-platform code sharing as much as we can, um, and we want to automate all the things. Um, so let's talk about what those principles are. Um, when we're talking about low cognitive overhead, you know, like we're all familiar with the JavaScript ecosystem, right? Um, the life of developers' choices, right? You know, am I going to make a, um, a client-side app or am I going to do server-side rendering? I don't know. Am I going to use TypeScript or JavaScript? I don't know. Am I going to use Node or Dino now or, or even Bun? You know, am I going to use Angular, React, Svelte, whatever the cool kids are doing nowadays? I'm not cool anymore. Uh, you know, how are we going to do data fetch? Okay, even if we decide to use GraphQL, you know, how are we going to stick that to our components? We have choices there, right? You know, how am I going to bundle everything for the browser? Um, Varun's probably going to tell me that I forgot about Veet, which is the actual cool thing. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, you know, you know, even running tests, there's like a bunch of different runners, and Storybook now is like full-fledged test runner as well. You know, so, you know, this, this is me, like every day, right? Um, and, you know, pretty soon for our developers, it's like doing even a trivial feature is like hard math, right? And, and the math isn't even about the feature, right? It's about the 14,000 different ways to, to do it, right? Like, this, this is silly. Um, so, you know, our team on the front-end platform team is to lower this cognitive overhead. And we do that actually by saying no a lot to new technologies. Um, but our, our um, you know, our, our offer to our developers is that if you use our stack, we are gonna sand it all nice and smooth, and when you have a problem with it, we're gonna like support you um, within like 20 minutes, and like we're gonna make it easy for you. Um, yeah, and we, you know, we wanna make sure that really, at our company, there's really only one way to do a given task. That's really our, our goal. We don't want people have to think about like which test runner to use, um, for example. But this does mean that we have to adopt new tools judiciously. Um, you know, this, this is another pictorial representation of, of my life, right? Um, you know, I have this nice stable stack and I'm doing features and then, you know, somebody reads Tech Radar and they're like, have you heard about Foo.js? And I'm like, what? Uh, well, we're not doing that right now. Um, we'll think about it. 
Um, but yeah, you know, innovation in our tool chain matters less to us than innovation in our product. And this is kind of the whole thing. We want people to focus on the features on the product. We don't want them to worry about too much about the tool chain. Um, so that brings me to our second principle, which is cross-platform code sharing. Um, we are um, producing UIs that have to run on iOS, that have to run on Android, um, you know, and we have a separate stack for, for web, but we want developing in all those stacks to, to feel the same, even if they're not exactly the same code. Um, and so we, we, we carefully choose our, our tools that give a good level of coverage for all those platforms. Um, and if a tool doesn't support all three platforms, we're probably not going to adopt it unless it does something like really super compelling. Um, so, you know, that's why we settled on React DOM, React Native, and, and a bunch of shared TypeScript libraries. Um, this is the sort of trifecta that gives us like a decent amount of platform coverage, but with escape hatches for when you need to do something special. Um, React Native in particular is a little bit hard to manage from the tool chain front, but we have a team for that, um, and they do a great job. Um, and then, of course, our third principle is automate all the things. Um, with the volume of code chains that's going into our pipeline, um, you know, you can never entirely get away from manual testing, but you want to automate as much as you can. Um, the more you automate, um, the more you free up people to focus on the really tricky flows, the really critical flows, the ones that make us money. Um, so we have a pretty sophisticated pipeline. Um, so when you open a PR, uh, we, we run a bunch of checks. We do ESLint. Um, we run TypeScript to check for type errors. Um, we run a whole bunch of unit tests. Um, we then run a whole bunch of snapshot tests, and this is actually, this is basically what we use Storybook and Chromatic for the most. Um, we do some fancy stuff to get combined coverage numbers out of those two things. Um, you know, we'll fail your PR if you don't have enough coverage. Um, we do a round of ally checks on accessibility, uh, so making sure that you're using DOM elements correctly making sure that you're following um, React Native guidelines around accessibility. Um, then we, you know, we build the app to make sure you didn't break the build. Um, and then we will fire up the app and put it behind a little web server and try and hit it from curl to make sure that it actually runs. And then finally, we'll let you merge. And the reason we do all these checks is that after you merge, um, we, we go straight to product, we deploy. Um, we deploy our internal documentation based on your changes, and we deploy our website. We're still working on automating um, mobile deploys, but that's, that's a different story. App stores make that a little tricky. Um, so where does Storybook fit? Well, Storybook is basically the thing that drives these four green boxes. Um, we use Storybook and Chromatic as a better form of snapshot testing. Um, you know, back in the day, people were doing these snapshot tests where it would like dump a bunch of JSON and a DOM to a text file and you'd go in your PR and you'd have to look at it and, and decide if you wanted to accept those changes or not. Um, Chromatic is a thousand times better. It just gives you pictures, pixels, you eyeball it, yes, no. Um, and that's how that works. Um, we also drive uh, accessibility testing using the Ally add-on and some extra glue that I wrote. Um, and finally, our um, internal UI toolkit, uh, their doc site is driven using add-on docs. Um, so that's, you know, the high level, and it works pretty well. Uh, we're constantly refining it over time, but I would say that Chromatic is like a huge piece of our front-end testing practice, and we're very happy with it. Um, however, there have been some challenges, and we do some weird stuff to get around it. Um, so coverage, uh, we have a convention um, in our company that you use uh, Jest and React Testing Library for any kind of behavioral unit test. And you're expected to write stories and run them through Chromatic um, for any kind of snapshot test. Um, the problem that we've had is that we didn't have a reliable way to extract coverage data uh, from the Chromatic run. Um, and the reason we want to do that um, is that we want to prevent people from writing silly tests with React um, testing library that do nothing except test the, the component mounts and renders because that's what snapshot testing is for and I don't want these pointless like RTL tests in the code base too. Um, so if we grant people coverage for stories then they don't have to do this to chase coverage in jest. Um, 
you know, uh, Varun's probably going to ask me, you know, or Sean, like, why don't you use Storybooks Test Runner? And I would love to. Um, but the reality is I already have over 20,000 tests written with Jest. We've already trained 150 developers to do it this way. <laughs> uh, you know, it works with React Native and React DOM, and we don't really have a chromatic equivalent for React Native. Um, and so, you know, it comes back to that idea of cognitive overhead. There is one way to write behavioral unit tests at our company, and between web and iOS and Android, um, and it, it's, it's that. So our current hacky solution is that I actually use a package called Story Shots, which is capable of loading up your, um, your storybook and running it from within Jest. It basically generates a bunch of Jest tests out of it. And so I just, like, at the end of all our tests, I, like, do that, and if it doesn't explode, I add that to the LCAP output and we get coverage credit. It works. Um, it slows down our test runs, so that's kind of annoying. Um, but it works. Um, so another challenge that we've had, and this is actually a little bit similar, um, there's the Ally add-on plugin, um, which you can enable, and it will basically look through the DOM output of your stories, and it will say, you know, oh, this button doesn't have a label, or like, these colors are too close together, and they don't, um, they don't fit the color contrast requirements from WCAG. Um, and these, these things show up in a nice little, little box um, in your storybook, and it's pretty great. And nobody looks at it, because it's in that little box that they don't open and they don't look at. So, uh, you know, if you introduce a new um, ally failure, I want CI to block you. I don't want you merging with me until you fix it. Um, Chromatic run doesn't, doesn't fail on these. Um, so my current solution, again, is I use Story Shots, and I also use Puppeteer, and we automate an instance of Chrome inside our CI container, and we just run through your entire storybook, um, and then Story Shots will fail uh, on any of these failures. Um, again, it works, it's great, um, but it's, it's actually really slow. Uh, automating browsers in CI is one of the slowest things we can do. Um, and it's brittle, every time they release a new Chromium or a new version of Puppeteer or, or whatever, it, it's like constantly breaking and we're constantly having to fix it. So that's, that's annoying. Um, another challenge that we have, uh, most of our teams use Chromatic and Storybook pretty much just for snapshot testing, but of course our design systems team um, is very heavy on the documentation side um, and it's a great tool for that. Um, but we were struggling with these like hybrid storybooks where like there's all this stuff of like nicely thought out and well written documentation and then like 30 like chromatic snapshot stories that didn't make any sense and our developers were looking at it, our designers were looking at it and they were like what, like the, the noise to signal ratio was way too high. Um, so I mean our solution to this was really just to adopt a convention. Um, so this is from one of our design system storybooks. You know, it's like intro, nice docs, there's a link to the Figma stuff, we're not on Storybook 7 yet. Um, you know, there's a preview, there's a controls thing where you can fiddle around with it. So that's all like the documentation part. And then, you know, all your little tests, you're gonna hide them in that little folder. Um, and that's just kind of how we do it. I, it's a little kludgy, but it works, and that's why I, you know, I'm happy with it. Um, and then I guess, you know, our, our, our fourth, challenge that I have, you know, talking to developers about this is like, what do I storify? Um, and we have, we have kind of two camps about this. We have the people who say, oh, it's only worth writing stories for like low level atomic components like buttons and, and, and things like that. Um, and then there's the other camp that says, I want to be able to write stories for absolutely everything. I want to be able to do it for a button. I want to be able to do it for the entire web page. Um, you know, there's value in, 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 in checking both of these things in CI. Um, and yeah, you know, I, why not both, right? Um, you should be able to write stories for both. Um, the issue is that, you know, it's always gonna be data fetch that's gonna screw you up when you try to do this. Uh, and you know, we, we used to write pages like this where we would blob all the data fetch in a top level component just so that people could write stories on these things easily, right? Um, and that's not fantastic, right? Because um, performance sucks because you're amassing a huge blob of props and you're just passing it down everywhere and anytime anything changes, you're re-rendering the entire screen. So that's, that's not great. Um, and then this code at the top level is just a dumping ground for spaghetti. You 
It was just completely impossible to manage. So we made a choice to move to this model, which is basically push your logic down the tree, use something like Apollo caching to dedupe requests. Um, and this turns out to be one of those rare situations where the clean code approach is also the fast approach. Um, but it kind of screwed us up with Storybook uh, until we discovered uh, Mock Service Worker and the Mock Service Worker add-on. And this is a great little piece of software that lets you basically just attach, these are all, these are all um, HTTP response fixtures and you just attach them to your story. Uh, and the browser, Mock Service Worker basically intercepts all the network activity and, and swaps your fixtures in. That's kind of the, the short version of it. Um, and so now we write stories for anything we want. We do it for the littlest button, we do it for the massivest screen. Um, and it's, it's really nice. Uh, there's one downside, I had to patch the add-on to make it work with React Native, so if anybody here can uh, get my PR reviewed, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> um, and then of course our final challenge is, is React Native. Um, there is unfortunately no chromatic equivalent. Um, and so much of what we do with Storybook depends on chromatic. Um, and also, you know, the, the React Native um, package lags behind the, the rest of the Storybook package by a major version. And because all of our stuff is on one repo, that limits our ability to adopt new versions of the web stuff. Um, you know, this, so this, you know, this is my man, Harold. He's old like me. Um, he drinks coffee all day like me. And in the first frame, he's sitting down and he's like, I'm going to do some web development because it's smooth and it works. And I feel confident about my changes. Um, now I need to port my feature over to mobile. And uh, it should be the same, right? Um, but as you can see in the bottom picture, it's, it's not the same. So <laughs> this is just my little plug. I love chromatic. I love storybook. I, I just I want more of it. Uh, yeah, so the conclusion, um, central to our automated practice. Um, we've worked around a couple of awkward things, but it's getting better every time. I'm eager to kick the tires on version seven and see what, when, you know, how many of my crazy bash scripts I can delete. Um, and uh, please, please, please do React Native, please. <laughs> that's, that's my talk. Three questions, okie doke. All right, go ahead. Um, you mentioned like the, the mobile development, things are pretty slow as compared to web. So do you use like native tools like screen readers for SCA processing for like, like Android or XO? So like the, so you can access JSON like if the labels are written side out or you can just just on your quick passage of a particular box or something like that. Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, you can automate stuff for accessibility testing, but only up to a point. Right. Um, the idea is um, the automation should be able to take care of the silly stuff um, to free up your time to actually go in there with voiceover um, on iOS, for example, and actually like listen with your ears and make sure that it makes sense. Um, yeah, there's there's no substitute for that. Um, but if you're spending time, you know, fiddling with the nesting of of like components in the JSX, that's time that you're not spending actually using voiceover. So we, we try to automate the the straightforward stuff, for sure. Yes, in the back, go ahead. Yeah, what are your thoughts on uh, Linux online testing coverage? I'm just wondering, because often when I work on a team, um, when there's a mandate for a certain level of coverage, sometimes the team ends up sort of gaming the system, just sort of writing in the test for the sake of bringing up the numbers. I often find that problems arise more on integration, the situation. So I was wondering, what is your philosophy on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great point, right? Yeah. Badly written unit tests are a millstone around everybody's neck, right? And I would rather have less coverage than badly written tests. Um, and so we're not, we're not maximalist about coverage. We're not saying thou shalt achieve 100%. Um, I believe we th set our threshold right now at, at, at 60%. Um, but we, we don't want to we don't want to regress, right? We want to kind of keep it at that level um, where most things are, are tested automatically. Now to your, to your point about um, integration testing, I have a long and stressful history with integration testing, like end-to-end -end testing, um, because it's, a, it's an excellent idea and 
it is, it is necessary, um, and it's also really hard. Um, the, the tools are brittle. You're automating browsers and stuff, or worse, automating emulators in the cloud. It breaks all the time. It's super duper slow. Uh, and just the, the data requirements, right? Like standing up a same data environment, not polluting your, your prod environment with a bunch of test data. But then if you try to keep a staging environment, it's impossible to make it properly look like production. Um, so our philosophy is test the things that are cheap, um, cheaply, and then for critical flows like you know onboarding or sign up or like moving money around, yeah, we integration test those definitely, um, but we don't want to have developers wait for three hours to integration test everything before they merge their PR. So it's kind of a bias towards cheap things, but when you have to do the expensive things, do them if that makes sense. Yep, another question in the back. Yeah, I'm wondering how long your like CI patches are. Do you deal with any like queue issues or what's your test or anything like that? How long <laughs> Our CI times are relatively lengthy. Um, so because we put everything in one mono repo, I, they're not the worst I've seen. Um, if you have to run the entire 163 NX projects, which you almost never have to do, um, I think it takes about an hour. But our average times, I believe, are about 10 or 11 minutes. Um, because NX is very good at figuring out what your change affects and then only running the checks on those things. Um, it's a great tool, by the way. Plug it. Yeah. If, you're, if you don't use it and you're dealing with large model repos, it's, it's worth a look. Um, th th I feel like there's a second part to your question. Uh, how do you deal, deal with like, flaky tests? Oh, yeah, flaky so tests. Uh, we actually, we use um, an integration with Datadog that actually monitors our test suites and alerts us when they're flaky. Um, and then the, the platform team goes in and disables them and goes and finds the offending team and nags them until they fix it. That's, that's our process. It's a bit manual. Um, but yeah, when we first put the big model repo together, we were having to test flake every single day. Now it happens maybe once or twice a week. So it's really just about the monitoring and the diligence and the nagging, I think, is really just doing the work. But yeah. OK, well, I guess that's my allotment of questions. So I will put the mic down. And thank you for listening.